always, always take a bag of stuff. Can we go to my first slide? So I got to Harvard about 10 years ago this month, and I came right off the battlefield to, to start there. And I picked up on a project that I had thought about when I was a graduate student, and that was making tools for drug discovery. So if you've been following the healthcare debate, and you've been following the trends and the way we fund healthcare research or biomedical research uh, in the United States, over the last quarter century plus, we've made quite a bit of progress uh, in terms of basic science. But if you take a look at the cost, the way we've put money in, and you take a look at the cost of healthcare, and you take a look at the diseases that we've got new therapeutic options for, uh, it's been a failure. And, and one of the questions is why has this happened? Why have we put so much money into biomedical research and we never got the return on it? If you take a look over here on the board, what you see is the model for drug discovery, where we, the pharmaceutical companies pick tens of thousands of randomly uh, modified chemical compounds and they throw them down on cells. And the first thing they look and ask is, did that chemical kill the cell? And if it didn't kill the cell, then they say, ah, it might be a therapeutic option, it might be a drug. And they start this whole long process that takes years, seven, 10 plus years, before they get down into clinical trials, phase one clinical trials, like Dr. June talked about yesterday. And they start giving it to patients. And after they've gone through phase one trials, which is really where they see if the drug is going to kill the patient, and, and phase two trials where they look and see if there's some kind of efficacy and get the doses right, and then phase three trials, by the time they get done with that drug trial, they're $1.8 billion in the hole. So when you ask yourself why your pills cost so much, it's because they're paying for a very inefficient, non-hypothesis-driven model of doing science. And when we started investing money in healthcare research, we put it all in basic research. We never talked to the companies that actually develop the therapeutics and give them to the clinic. And I've been in biomedical research for a long time. I've never had a physician come by my laboratory at 9 o'clock and say, hey, Parker, I got this guy coming at 11. What have you got whipped up today that I can give him? The industry is the instrument to get this technology or these therapeutics to the, the patient. And we haven't ever really talked to industry about what they need. And what they need is tools to make this pipeline more efficient. They need tools to help them discover faster and more effective. It turns out that when you start developing drugs, one of the big things that they're worried about is what are the effects on the heart? So heart disease is the number one killer in the United States and in the, the industrialized world. But every drug that you take is subject to cause cardio, cardiovascular effects or, or aberrant cardiovascular effects. It doesn't matter if it's a cancer drug, if it's a Parkinson's disease drug, all of these drugs have a long history of causing cardiovascular failure. And so one of the things I started working on in my laboratory was developing tools to mimic heart function. So what we did was we took a look at the heart and we figured, hey, listen, it's built a little bit like a roll of toilet paper. It's this laminar muscle that's wrapped around the ventricular chamber. The, kind of like a toilet paper, roll of toilet paper. The blood goes in there and the muscle contracts and it squeezes it out. And no pharma company has any kind of tool to do that. So we were inspired, we started thinking about origami, we started thinking about fruit roll-ups, that children's uh, snack. You know, it's got the fruit paste on the wax paper. And we said, hey, listen, let's build something like that. But what we did was we took the outer coating on a breast implant, a polymer, and we built a laminar piece of muscle like you see in the heart. So it's not a fruit roll-up, it's a meat roll-up and it's alive. And we start building these organs on chips. And the whole idea is to use stem cell technology to start using stem cells, human cells, put them down on chips right away so early in the process you can start to see if these drugs are going to kill anybody. Early on, organs on chips, the whole idea of meshing everything we've learned in the development of microelectronics with everything we've learned in stem cells over the last 50 years. And so we, we made quite a bit of progress with that. The only problem was is that I have this moonlighting gig. and. Uh, it was a bit distracting. Uh, I kept going back and forth to Afghanistan. Uh, I've been over four times, two tours and then two special missions. And uh, when I'm not going back and forth to Afghanistan, I'm, I'm going to Washington to talk to people about science and technology problems that are coming up on the battlefield. And it's not because I'm some kind of a genius. It's just I'm the only scientist they know that's ever been shot at. So they, they call me to come and look at it. And so it was getting really hard to concentrate on these. This is a video from my last patrol in 2009 down in the, in the Tangy Valley. It was getting really hard to concentrate because I was going back and forth. It also was getting really hard to concentrate for friends of mine that were getting blown up by roadside bombs, improvised explosive devices. So I had been looking at this for a while and finally decided, well, I better get a piece of the science fight 
I had this long list of things that pissed me off when I was in Afghanistan. And so I said, hey, listen, what I'm going to do is a little bit of science for each one of these, and that's what I'm going to tell you about today. And the first thing that got me into this was a friend of mine who got wounded um, in Iraq, and his brain injury was mistreated. And in all fairness, we didn't even really know what a concussion was until 2005, 2006. So we're kind of behind in understanding the whole brain injury problem. But that's what got me into this. So I went back and I started talking to the pharma companies. And, and something very inter we saw something very interesting. None of them ever thought about brain injury. Not a single one. There's only one pharma company that I know of that has a very small program on brain injury. No one else does. Because no one ever thinks about brain mechanics. The brain is inside the skull. It's mechanically protected. No one ever thinks about a shock wave propagating through the brain. It looks very much like this jello that my friend Josh Gosh is, is stumping. Josh is, works in my lab. He's got two combat tours in Iraq. So when we started talking to the pharma companies, it became very clear that A, they didn't know enough to get into the field. They didn't realize how big the field was. But they also, they didn't have the tools. And that sounded very familiar to us because we had been addressing these issues with heart disease. We knew that the pharmaceutical industry didn't have the right tools to do heart disease. They sure didn't have the right way to, to mimic an IED blast or a blindside quarterback sack that, you know, the fundamental basis of, of a concussion. So we decided that what we had to do was start developing tools to arm the pharmaceutical company for, for the TBI fight. And this is important because now what we understand about brain injury is that it potentiates all these neurodegenerative diseases, many of which are the primary uh, health care expenditure here in the States, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, and now we have some early data that suggests even Lou Gehrig's disease is potentiated by brain injury. So now what we're doing, and just last week we had a the first pharmaceutical company come to our laboratory to take a look at our tools. We combined everything we knew about explosives. I've got about a half dozen veterans of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan in my lab. We get them from Bunker Hill Community College and, and other places around the country. They come and work in our laboratory. We use their expertise that they got in the battlefield. We combine it with what my postdocs and graduate students know about tissue engineering. And we put together these whole uh, uh, tool sets so that we can start to challenge the original uh, paradigms about brain injury, and one of the first things we did was we found that the me mechanism of cellular injury in those brain cells is completely different than what the field had thought, all because we built some new tools. Now, one of the things that, you know, you see a lot of bad things on the battlefield. And uh, I had a lot of soldiers, a lot of friends of mine, that came back with some pretty serious wounds. Uh, one of the things that you're never really prepared for is what happens to children on the battlefield. So you see a child who's been burned like this, you see a soldier who's got these debilitating scars, and you start thinking about wound healing. So several years ago at Harvard, I got this idea that we could make nanofibers for a regenerative medicine with a cotton candy machine. And so I went and told all my graduate students, hey, listen, I think we can make nanofibers with a cotton candy machine. And there's this really complex structure that every, uh, process everyone used for making nanofibers. It's called electrospinning. It's the industry standard. Everyone swears by it. I said, no, nah, I think we can do it with a cotton candy machine. And you know, everyone was looking at me like I'd lost my mind. It was too easy. It was too absurd. So I got orders to go back to Afghanistan for another combat tour. And I went to Josh, who had just gotten back from Iraq. We kind of zigzagged back and forth. And I said, hey, Josh, go buy a cotton candy machine, put it in the laboratory, and just let people play with it, and let's see what happens. And so we did. And I went, I came back about nine months later out of combat, and they had, there was a pile of junk in the corner of the laboratory, and they had crossed a centrifuge with a cotton candy machine, and we'd made nanofibers. And we were able to do it at about here. Put a little nano in your life. You know, pass one of these back. Huh? We, they had done it, and we, we can produce nanofibers at about, at about, good hands, dude. Um, we, we do nanofibers at about ten, five, six times the industry standard. And the great thing about this is we could do it with biodegradable polymers. You can take these things home or you can open them up. It doesn't matter to me. I'll tell you, I'm not going to throw them anymore so we don't have a bad display of athletic ability on, <laughs> on the internet. But one of the great things that we could do is we could make nanofibers out of proteins. And we weren't talking about just any proteins. It turns out that when you do a surgery on a baby inside the womb, when the baby's born, there's no scar. Because there's a certain class of proteins that causes scarless wound healing in the baby. And so we figured, hey, listen, if we can make, take these same proteins that we can make nanofibers, can we make wound dressings out of these proteins in such a way that we don't have these debilitating scars, that we can heal faster, less infections, and that we'll also get hair regrowth? So it turned out that we did. We were able to do that. And the early animal studies showing that we're putting these things down on 
on, on rodents. We're getting all this. You can see over here on the right, when you take a look at the histology, you can see that we're getting hair follicles early on. The wounds are closed with no infection. The whole idea is at least develop a set of wound dressings so we can take this beautiful child and uh, make her feel as good about herself as, as we feel about her. So the other issue I had was I, I, I don't like getting shot at. And um, it, was, it was happening a lot in 2009 when I was over there. And one of the reasons why is because the Army had made this decision that they were going to make one camouflage pattern that was going to be good for all environments. How many of you have ever used a universal tool, a tool that's good for everything? Your careers are finite. Um, <laughs> so we're wearing this camouflage uniform. I mean, I make a joke out, but people were getting killed over there. Folks were getting shot wearing this camouflage over there. I mean, you stuck out. You look at that. That doesn't fit in there. Uh, and so I started thinking about camouflage. This was a $1 billion mistake made by the U.S. Army. And, and, and right after October 1st, you're going to see the announcement of another camouflage pattern they're going to replace this. They had congressional hearings about this. This was bad. I was only slightly less conspicuous than if I'd had a road flare duct taped on my forehead out there. And it turned out that all of the services had decided with all their flush, all the flush money they had from the war on terror that they were going to develop all different camouflage patterns. So now every service has their own camouflage pattern. So there's a couple of things that you see right away here. First of all, that there's obviously the same science is not behind all these camouflage patterns. And second of all, some of these services are making a fashion statement in their camouflage pattern. And I would argue that if the objective of the camouflage is to not be seen, that's the inverse problem of fashion, which is to be seen and make a statement. So you're seeing a, a pretty serious mistake here, and, and, and it's cost you a lot of money. I say my army when I'm proud of it, but it's your army when I'm not. And it was your army that made this decision. So we started this effort at, 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 at Harvard. It, it turns out that, you know, nature does natural camouflage all the time. Cephalopods, cuttlefish, octopus, squids, they have natural coloration changes. They can adapt to their environment. So that means there's no physical laws against adaptive camouflage. And, and it turns out that these sea creatures have these very unique bio-nanophotonic structures in their skin that allow them to adapt into any type of environment. And at the same time, I started teaching a classes in fashion design at the engineering school. Uh, you can imagine how well that went over. Let me tell you a funny story about this. I called a neuroscientist at Harvard to ask her to help us teach this fashion class. And she said, what do a bunch of guys know about fashion? And I said, well, first of all, men know a lot about fashion. Second of all, we have female engineers at Harvard. Um, Maybe not other places. So we started teaching this class and started making uh, models or demos. The whole idea was to make fashions that were bigger than the garment. We put sensors in them. We put light sources. We put fiber optics. The whole idea to start to understand what it would be like to instrument a clothing, a clothing item. And what we did was on the cuttlefish, in the meantime of the cuttlefish, what we did was we reverse engineered these nanophotonic structures that you see in their skin. We found out that it's this really this collective network of proteins that allow you to modulate light. They fluoresce, they reflect light, they absorb light. Then we went back to our cotton candy machine after we'd extracted these proteins and we started building these things into fibers. And now the whole idea is we want to make textiles that have these same types of photonic structures that you see in a cuttlefish so I can have that adaptive camouflage. And really what I want to do is have an, an invisible suit when I'm getting chased by someone with a honey-do list. So the thing that bothered me the most about the war was the way we were fighting. So we have an entire military and defense industrial complex which is predicated on the assumption that war is an acute event. And in that model of warfare, the primary objective is to kill people and break things. But we're fighting in third world countries and in cultures where war is a chronic condition and we're fighting counterinsurgency. And so the primary objective of counterinsurgency is not to kick a door and break, break down things and, and kill people. It's to go in and make a friend. You go in and you make a friend, and your friend either leads you to the enemy or you empower that friend to go find their enemy and, 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 and get rid of them. And, and this is important because insurgents, bad people, they live off the passive support of the good people. They get right up close. And your primary objective when you're doing counterinsurgency is to peel the two apart. You obviously know what we're doing in Afghanistan. We're trying to peel the Taliban away from the rest of the population. So when it comes to killing people and breaking things, we understand the science behind that. It's all Newtonian physics. 
right? Someone drives a tank into the open, I know what kind of metal it's made of, I know exactly how much ordnance I've got to put down on that tank in order to destroy it, right? It's all Newtonian physics. What's the science behind getting a friend? If I go meet some guy, who's, where in the Department of Defense do you see the science and say, hey, listen, how do I go into some village, some guy whose language I don't speak, I have no common experience, I'm only there for a 12-month rotation at best, I gotta go in there and get this guy to trust me so much that he's gonna dare to send his daughter to school. You know what kind of balls that takes to do something like that? It takes a lot. What kind of science do we do to back this thing up? We don't really do any. When I first got to Afghanistan, my first tour, uh, they gave me a gun and they gave me $10,000 in cash. They said, hey, go out there and make something happen. So, you know, you, you can make something happen quite easily with that in Afghanistan. So imagine this scenario, I go into this village, and I go up to this village leader, and I got, you know, 100, 200 gunslingers behind me, we all just jumped off of helicopters. And I walk in that village leader, and I say, hey, listen, we can either do things the hard way, or we can do it the easy way. The easy way is, you make me, let me pay for stuff. Because this whole American model was that money is a weapon system, surely they're like us if we're paying for stuff, right? Everyone likes money, but we didn't really give them an option. And so we start paying for stuff. We spend all this money on reconstruction, the whole idea that we're going to jet propel a country like Afghanistan, which is roughly in 12th century AD, to the Industrial Revolution of the United States, the early 1900s, you know, everyone there with their hair on fire. So do you think those friendships are going to be genuine and sustainable? No, they're not. This model's not sustainable for us either. We've got money, but we don't have that much money. But that was basically what we were doing. This is the tool because we have no doctrinal template, we have no training for the force of personality. And that's what it takes to fight counterinsurgency. So when I got back from Afghanistan, I'd heard about this gang, I started thinking about gangs. And uh, I heard about this gang problem in Salinas, California, and I heard the police department had talked to the Naval Postgraduate School. So I went out to the Naval Postgraduate School, had a discussion, they said, yeah, we had one chat, that was about it. And I went down to Salinas and I spent the night going to gang hangouts. And I came back and I wrote a white paper for a government agency that was advised, and I said, listen, we can use inner city gang problems as a laboratory for counterinsurgency methods. Counterinsurgency methods. The gangs also rely on the passive support of the population. They target at-risk populations or neighborhoods. It's a perfect model for insurgency. And it turns out that gangs evolve into insurgents, and when you beat an insurgency, they devolve back into a gang. So it's the whole continuum of conflict. So, you know, they looked at me like I'd lost my mind, and uh, I was you know, driving around, talking to people, telling anyone that would listen, hey, listen, we need to do some science behind this counterinsurgency. And so I was at my National Guard unit one weekend, I was talking about this. And my friend Mike Catone, who's 20 years in Army Special Forces and he's a mass state trooper, was sitting across the table when I'm up there preaching uh, one Saturday morning at my National Guard unit. And he said, hey, listen, we got a bad problem in Springfield, Mass, and we've been thinking about doing this. In the north end of Springfield, they were selling Afghan heroin. It never, never leaves you alone, it follows you forever. And they were riding around on motorbikes with assault rifles slung over the back. I mean, this is right out of Kandahar, Mogadishu. I mean, they owned this neighborhood. And Mike and his guys were just back from Iraq. And they put together a small Massachusetts State Police Special Projects team, all of combat veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan. And they basically turned them loose so they could go rogue in this neighborhood and apply these counterinsurgency methods because absolutely nothing else was working. So when they told me about this, I started talking to them, and over about a year or two, I finally I said, hey, listen, I teach this design class at Harvard. Let me see if we can apply this to kind of help you. So I go to the dean. I said, hey, dean, I need to teach an engineering design class full of about a dozen 20-year-old kids who've never had a job before about how to apply counterinsurgency techniques in an inner-city neighborhood soaked in Afghan heroin. We're going to be down there on the streets about twice a week. It's going to be cool, trust me. She said, okay. So we had this little room in, in, in one of the buildings on campus, and we had a map of every crack house in the north end of Springfield in there. And, and this group of students really worked their butt off. We came in, we developed a whole set of analytics to analyze this neighborhood. Everything from litter and graffiti to standardized test scores in the schools, the incidents of violence in the schools, STD rates, calls for service, and crime. And what we found was that they were applying counterinsurgency properly because what you do is you make a friend and you let the host or the good people realize that, hey, that law enforcement agent, that law enforcement officer, that's my instrument to clean up my own neighborhood. 
And so that's what they did. We showed great effects from this, and now it's turning into a national model. We get requests from police departments every day to come in and apply this counterinsurgency method in their streets. And we spun a company out. The students started a company. They're filming the software in, 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 in L.A. right now. So I've got to be really quick here. Remember I told you at the beginning that I was interested in the heart. So all of this time I'm doing all this war science, I was still thinking about the heart in the, in the back of my mind. And I really wanted to make a big advance, very frustrated with the way we treat heart disease. And I decided, hey, listen, what I got to do is I got to flank the problem because I don't want to be part of the herd going head on. We're not doing anything. So I happened to be at the New England Aquarium one day, and I saw this jellyfish swimming around. And I thought, hey, listen, that's just like the heart. It's a muscular pump. And, you know, I can build that. So the whole idea was, hey, what if one of the reasons why we're not good at solving heart disease is because we don't understand the fundamental laws of muscular pumps? What if that's the problem? And any engineer will tell you, if you try to build something, you can you can usually learn something about it. And you start to take a look at the spatial scales of the jellyfish and the heart. They're not very similar until you get down to the subcellular level. So we had this idea, hey, let's study the jellyfish. And when we studied the jellyfish, what we found was electrically and mechanically it behaves just like the heart, just like the heart. So we took the jellyfish and we made a map of where every cell was in the jellyfish. And then we took a rat apart and we built it cell by cell as a jellyfish. So we took this thin film technology I told you about, the outer coating and breast implant. We took a map, a template for the map of where all the cells were in the jellyfish, and we built it onto this polymer thin film. Then we took the rat cells and put them down on there, and they self-organized into a muscular structure that looks very much like the jellyfish. We matched it almost precisely. These are the rat cells coming down onto the map of where the jellyfish muscle cells were. They self-organized, they formed the tissue, This is what we built. This is what the jellyfish was. This is the jellyfish architecture, so we're pretty close. We quantified it using fingerprint software that we got from a law enforcement agency. We put it in a bucket of salt water and put a, a pacemaker in there. You can see the heart cells beating, beating there. Those are rat cells. And what you're seeing here is the jellyfish, which is going to take its first swim strokes. It's a little bit awkward when it sits out. We're peeling it off of the substrate there. These are the first swim strokes of this jellyfish. And it's important to keep in mind that 96 hours before this first swim, there was a rat walking around uh, in the laboratory. And what we were able to do is we were able to match the hydrodynamic performance of this jellyfish precisely with this ratfish, or metasoid as we called it. What was this? Why did we do this? Because I want to be called Frankenstein? No. <laughs> this is a training exercise. I want to build a heart, right? I want to replace hearts in patients that need them. But I need to build a muscular pump and route to that. I need to hone my skills. So for me, this is training. And what we found was we learned quite a bit about how to build a muscular pump by building a jellyfish. So I'm going to close, and I feel like I should leave you with some big spiritual message here in keeping with the, with the, keeping with the show here. But I, I want to say this about innovation. Uh, first of all, Innovators, I've never met anyone, I'm not saying I'm an innovator, but the innovators I've got on my research team are almost always angry about something. I've never met an innovator who's happy. I've never met an innovator who feels helpless. I've never met an innovator who didn't want the freedom to operate. And I never met an innovator who didn't work much because that eureka moment to solve that problem is going to come like a thief in the night. And if you're not working, if you're not ready for it, you'll never get it. Thanks.